Islam boys? Islam. How's everyone in the holy night? Praise Allah. Arise, giving all praises to Allah, the Father of the universe, cherisher, and sustainer of all the balanced universes. We extend the highest of honors to his holy and divine prophet, prophet, noble, dry, leading founder, the Moorish, science temple of America. Islam. Islam. We extend high honors as well to its forerunner, the honorable Marcus Mazzaia Garvey, the founder of the Universal Negro Improvement Association, the UNIA, Universal Negro Improvement Association, mm -hmm. who did indeed warn and stir up the nations. Islam. Islam. We extend high honors as well to the Moorish flag, the red flag with the green five point star, the center, the five points representing love, truth, peace, freedom, and justice. Islam. Islam. We extend high honors as well to the American flag, also known as the Stars and Stripes. This flag exists as a constant reminder that the European owes you the Moors with compound interest. Islam. Extending high honors to the noble sheik staff, the noble vanguard staff who keep the peace, and giving honors to you, the hills and bays, for without you there is no more Islam. Islam. Praise Allah. Um, to open, I'd like to draw from uh, Moorish literature the article entitled, What Shall We Call Him? Right? The reason why I want to draw from What Shall We Call Him is that, you know, here we are in 2017, and our people still find themselves in a, condi you know, a condition where they do not know what to call themselves. That's we're still right. in a condition where we're utilizing someone else's names. That's right. We're still in a condition where we're using somebody else's religion. And as a result of this, we are not, we will not be recognized by any of the civilized nations upon the earth. Islam? Wow. All right? According to this article, which is extracted from the Moorish Guide newspaper, which was the newspaper of the Moorish Science Temple of America back in 1928, started in 1928, came out every Friday, every holy day. And uh, it kept us abreast on the affairs of the, you know, the Moorish movement, um, as well as what was going on with our people in general, and uh, the position and direction of the Prophet Noble Jurali that he wanted for his people. Islam? Wow. All right. What shall we call it? It says, so often our various journalists find trouble in selecting the proper name for the Moorish American. Some say Negro. Another will brand him race man. Still another will call him Afro-American. And then come color, uh, dark American, coon, shine, the brethren, and your folks. It is indeed a hard matter to find something suitable for the various occasions where a title needs to be used. Is it that these people have no proper name? Did they have a national name when first brought to these shores in the early part of the 17th century? If so, what was it? Did not the land from which they were forced have a name? It now appears a good idea for those whose duty it is to write for the various journals to find out what the national name of the forefathers of these people was. Also, look into the history of the founders of civilization and see who they were and where they stood in the building of the present civilization. Probably two hours in an up-to-date library would serve to relieve the strain on our men of letters. When the occasion presents itself for a title for these people, for, for these people, the matter of the various names given to these 22 million in Guinness in 1928 with all colors of every race of the globe was an act of European psychology. I'm going to repeat that again. European psychology. Islam? Islam. They gave him a name, then defined it as something inferior to theirs. White, they defined as a color of purity. Black, they say represents everything evil. The Negro, as they were called in this nation, not the nations of the earth, but this nation, right? Um, have no nation to which they might look to with pride, look with pride. Their history starts with the close of the Civil War, or more properly with his being forced to serve someone else. Thus he is separated from the illustrious history of his forefathers, who were the founders of the first civilization of the old world. This matter should be looked into with a hope of correcting it. Islam? Surely Allah speaks the truth to his holy and divine prophet and noble Dralee. Islam? All right? The reason, what, what is the situation the prophet is addressing? He's addressing something known in a legal sense as a condition. Okay? You talk about Negro, Black, colored, African American, Latino, Latina, so on and so forth. These are what are known as conditions. Right? These constitute what are known as Yeah. 
status injuries. Notice the word injury is used, right? Another word for a condition, a more properly an improper condition, is a mark. Example, if you get an injury in your physical form, it leaves a scar, right? So if you were conquered by a foreign people and subjugated, so on and so forth, you were injured by them, were you not? And as a result of the injuries, there should be a mark that's left, shouldn't it? Well, the marks that were left upon, you know, after what was done to us were the titles of Negro, Black, Colored, African American, right? And the result therefrom, right, are the names of Williams, Smith, Jones, Johnson, Culpepper, Gonzalez, Rodriguez, Sanchez, and so on and so forth. Right? Because contrary to popular belief, we gotta be all in place, it's a global thing here, right? The reason why we have to be global, you know, all inclusive is because the first names we were hit with, I'm talking about people putting their family names on us. Right? First names we were hit with were not English names because we were not first conquered by the English. No. Who were we first conquered by? I'm talking about as Moors. Right? Sure. Through the history of the Moors from 711 to 1492. Okay? In Spain. Right? right? You'll find out it was the Spanish that overthrew the Moors. No. Right? At that point, they didn't even have a, there was no Spain yet at that point. They were still barbarians. Right? Mm -hmm. But they put their family names on us. And once they took our religion away from us, Right? They baptized us, called us Catholics, mm -hmm. and from that point we had to take on European names. Nice. And these European names were Spanish names at first. Right? Um, after the, you know, you'll find the, uh, the Spanish and the English went to war. The Spanish Navy was called the Spanish Armada. Nissan has a truck called the Armada, right? It's a big old yeah. gas guzzling truck. But the point is, is that this Spanish Navy, you gotta remember, if they were barbarians, they didn't have a Navy, right? So where did the Spanish Armada, where did, where did these barbarians get a Navy from? A bunch of ships, and you know, to sail, you know, you have to know navigation. To know navigation, you have to know how to read the stars. You have to be taught that the only people that knew that were your forefathers, right? The Moors, right? But after this war was fought and the, you know, and the Spanish lost to the English, the English looked and said, okay, well, how did they subjugate the Moors? And they started studying the Spanish systems of what was done under what was known as, uh, as the Spanish Inquisitions. Okay? The leader of the Inquisition was known as the the Inquisitor General, right? When you research this period, when, you know, you ask yourself, well, how did our people become Catholic? How did our people become Christian? It wasn't like they asked us to become Christian. We said yes, right? There, there were heinous things done to the Moors to make them accept that ideal, like the system grand government demonstrated, okay? Because their ideal of what they're calling Jesus had nothing to do with us. Right? Their ideal of what they were calling Jesus had everything to do with supporting the position of the Catholic Church, which is specifically called the what? What kind of Catholic Church? What do they call it? The Roman? You can speak up right now. Roman. They, the Roman Catholic Church. So they put nationality with religion. But here they'll tell you there's a separation between church and state. Notice that. There never has been. Islam? If, if that was the case, even in this country, the Supreme Court would not open up in a prayer. That's supposed to be the highest court in the land, right? So they should know, but they open up the press. So it's a farce, right? But the point is, is that it was during this time here, right here, right? Um, anybody heard of the uh, the torture known as waterboarding? Mm -hmm. Right? They take a person time, kind of hang them a little upside down a little bit, put a rag over the face and put pour water in their nostrils and drown them, mm -hmm. you know, to make them tell a particular truth, right? This was first mastered during the time period when your forefathers were overthrown during the Inquisitions. Okay? Do you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? No. Again, do you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? No. This is how our people were converted. It was forced conversion. That's right. Islam? So what happened was, there was a group of people amongst the, amongst the Moors in Spain. Give me a little history. Right? You had a contingency of Israelites. Alright? That were, you know, they were with the Moors in Spain. Okay? They were known as 
conversos, while the Moors, when they had, you know, were forced into Catholicism, they became known as the Morisco, which means little more, meaning that you're no longer an adult, you're a child, okay? This is the first concept of you being considered a ward of the state, okay? Meaning that the government is responsible for you. They're responsible for your education. Like right now in Nigeria, you can't go to school, like, you know, the popular schools that they have that are run by, you know, influenced by the Europeans. Mm -hmm. You have to, you know, get rid of your tribal name and take a European name to go to school. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to say going over Sanjo, you can't go to school unless you become John Williams. Okay? It's not new. They've been doing this. See, the Europeans' idea behind this is that why change it if it works? Okay? And this was all worked out during that period of time of 1492 to 1610. Okay? Now, question you have to ask yourself, you're looking for an identity for your people, you can't look after 1492. Because if you look after 1492, that's when we got invaded. That's right. That's when they took everything from us. That's when they allocated what they wanted us to have. Mm -hmm. Anything that we had after that period was because they allowed us to have it. Mm -hmm. So you have to look at who you were before that. That's right. Okay? So in February, you know, when they're infamous Black History Month, they like to tell us that we came, we come from West Africa. Mm -hmm. that, right? You know, most of us came from West Africa on slave ships, the whole narrative, right? right? If that narrative is true, right? And you deal with West Africa, okay? Okay? First of all, the boundary lines that you have here as West Africa are not, they're new. These were created in. That's right. <laughs> The Berlin Conference. Okay? Right. The Berlin Conference is when the Europeans got together to decide along uh, financial and commercial interests where they were going to cut the property up. That's right. See, Algeria here has a huge chunk because that's because the French, you know, after that 1610 period, had a huge financial interest and a huge military to carve out a bigger border than let's say Libya did or Tunisia did, which was occupied by Italy. Okay? So what happens is before all that time period, this whole section right here was governed by, you know, it was considered an empire. Okay? It was governed by this man right here known as Morocco. Okay? The Moorish Sultan of Morocco governed all the subordinate kingdoms, Mali, so on and so forth. And all of them paid taxes and tribute to the Sultan of Morocco primarily to keep the European nations out. Okay? Because from the time of the Romans, when they came and invaded, there was a problem with them coming in and pushing into Northern Africa and trying to get into Sub-Saharan Africa. That's right. When Islam came across, it swept across Northern Africa, and as we were sweeping across, we weren't just you know sweeping across and subordinate people according to you know the religion of Islam. Right. No, we were making deals with people. Mm -hmm. You can keep your tribal customs. We don't care what you do. We gotta get these foreign invaders out. Right. You see, and that's what Islam represented in North and Northwestern Africa. And like I like to point out all the time, is that there was a northern border and two flanks, right? So when Islam came across, it came over into northern, you know, northern Africa, pushed them all, all the Europeans out back into southern Europe, all right? Mm -hmm. Islam protected the northern part of Africa and both the west and the east. So the Europeans who were not advanced in navigation, they didn't know how to sail around to come around, you know, come around and get into Africa. And at the same time, the Moorish Navy protected the Atlantic and the Mediterranean. You know, this Red Sea wasn't even here. You know, right. that's the Suez Canal, that's, that's right. man-made, right? But so, the Moors protected this right here under the law known as the law of the closed sea, meaning that if you didn't have our permission, you couldn't sell. Right, if we caught you selling our waters, we board your ship, take you hostage, and begin negotiations to get your ransom down, okay? But the point is that that's what Islam did for Africa, right? right? And people, when they, when they give the revisionist history about Africa, they tend to leave that out, right. okay? Because one thing about Islam that people don't like is the discipline of it, yes, right? Sir. People like, like as the you know the assistant grand governor demonstrated, they like the YouTube era of consciousness, mm -hmm. okay? Because with that, there's no nation building. There's no, we're gonna pool our resources and build a school mm -hmm. for the babies, right? There's no, we're gonna get together and you know the sisters are gonna master, um, what do you call it, midwifing, right? So that way Europeans don't have to pull our babies out. That's right. Which is, to me, is one of the supreme violations, right? 
Uh, to allow a foreigner, mm -hmm. excuse me for being vulgar, to you know stick his hand inside your wife to pull out your baby. Mm -hmm. Right? You're not free if you're still doing it. That's right. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So it's like with this YouTube era consciousness, there is none of that. Mm -hmm. Right? And in this country here, when that mentality was first formulated, and like we need something for ourselves, mm -hmm. we got to do for ourselves. That charge was led by the Muslims. Uh. There was a lot of groups that were here. You know, I mean, there was a brother named um, Edward Blyden. That's right. Right? Edward Blyden was in the late 1800s. Mm -hmm. He was a missionary who traveled all over, but he traveled through the Islamic world. And he saw he was a Christian. That's right. But he said, you know, what I see in, you know, in the Islamic countries that if Islam can do that for the Africans, perhaps it could do something for our people here. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, he taught that before Noble Drali, but he never formed a nation. That's right. He never formed an organization for the salvation of our people. Wow. It wasn't his calling to do so. That's right. right? But when you start talking about Mark, the Honorable Marcus Mazzai, Garvey, you know, Prophet Noble Drop Lee, you know, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, all these ones that were dealing with this concept of Islam, and I'm not talking about the Islam of the East. And that's the big phobia that our people have, right? Yeah. I don't want to worship some Arab. Anybody yeah. talk about no Arab ideal? Islam. You know what I'm saying? That the Islam that was brought to us by the masters that brought it to us, right? They augmented it by way of Allah to be able to deal with our condition. Teach. You know what I'm saying? So those of us that were on drugs or prostituting or drinking or smoking cigarettes or doing whatever we were doing, if you start dealing with these teachings of Islam, or Islamism, as Prophet Noble Ali would say, and you deal with it from any particular aspect of sincerity, you'll notice that after a while, you'll start cleaning yourself up. You'll notice that people that have been dealing with some form of Islam for a long time, you know, 10, 20 years or more, it's almost like the clock stops for them. They don't age, you know? I would, I'm, I'm not going to use my brother right here, but as an example, I don't know how old my brother is. I'm not going to ask him, but I know he's been on this path for a while and preserves Islam, Islam. all right? But it's something known as the restrictive laws of Islam that we, you know, that was put forth by our forefathers that gave us a system whereby we can go back and become our forefathers. That's Your forefathers right. didn't know nothing about aging. <laughs> Your forefathers didn't know nothing about osteoporosis. High blood pressure and diabetes and all that type of stuff. All of those are what are referred to as slave conditions. That's right. Right? These are things that slaves suffer. Right? Primarily because you don't control anything about your existence, particularly how food is grown. Right? Mm -hmm. We constantly put stuff in our mouth, but we don't know where it came from. That's right. Right? You see anybody seen the uh, what's it called? Uh, food ink, I think it's called. Yeah. yeah. Right? They talk about Tyson chicken, the biggest chicken manufacturer in America, right? right? Might be the world, but I know at least America. But they show up in North Carolina, the chicken factories, mm -hmm. right? And they got them in their slave ship style. I mean, they yeah. wing the wing. I wish they showed show their last show, right? But wing the wing, right? That's and they right. zoom in on one so you can hear and breathe. And my man's breathing like he got asthma. Mm -hmm. It's wheezing, mm -hmm. right? The chicken is, they can go from egg to full grown chicken in like two and a half weeks, wow. right? So, it's grew, you know, and, you know, with, with this, you know, the steroids and the hormones they got them on and stuff like that. It's bigger than it's supposed to be, so it's bigger than the leg will allow it to stand. So the thing stands up, takes two steps, drops down, and starts wheezing. You gonna eat that? Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. You know, we don't get enough of going to these uh these little wing shops and eating that stuff. You see what I'm saying? Because all we're doing is poisoning ourselves, yeah, right. poisoning our babies. And again, if you haven't addressed. The slave condition. Again, we have a baby in here, mother and a child. Thank you for bringing the baby. Right? I always love to have babies in the present in the room because that means the future is present. That's right. right. But if we're not dealing with, you know, the, you know, addressing these slave conditions and going back to our original mind, mm -hmm. you know, what inheritance are we, we gonna leave the babies? Exactly. What are we gonna teach that young man right now? Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? We gotta teach him something about himself that's empowered. You it's see? Fun. Not that not just dealing with, you know, that slave condition. I want to deal with a word here. Right? Like introducing words. <clears throat> exile. I don't know if you ever heard that, but you know, when one is in exile, you'll notice that he'll have to leave, or she'll have to leave their home country, usually due to a particular political reason. Okay? Now, if you know anything about the Bible, which if you know anything about the Bible, the Bible deals with. It's, it's speaking in degrees of understanding, mm -hmm. okay? So you can take it literal if you want to, mm -hmm. but the masters who got together to devise those things, devise it in such a way that there is a universal teaching in there. There's a lot of propaganda on it, facts. Mm -hmm. 
But under it, there's a universal teaching that you could that you could utilize for present day ancients, or however you want to do it. All right. But we'll get that to a minute, you know, in a minute. But let's deal with exile. All right. Random House Collegiate Dictionary. Exile. Prolonged separation from one's country or home, as by forced circumstances. Anyone separated from his country or home. Expulsion from one's native land by authoritative decree. Okay? Authoritative decree. Now, anybody knows anything about the doctrines of discovery, right? Which are orders given by the Pope of Rome to take everything away from the Moors. That was done, but that's an actual law that was passed. Series of laws, actually. Okay? And, you know, it's basically designed to exile the Moors. A person banished from his native land. The, the exile known as the Babylonian captivity of the Jews, which is a degree of understanding. It's not necessarily in liberal history, right? Uh, to separate from the country, home, etc. To expel or banish a person, person from his country. It comes from the Middle English, exil, right? From the word exul, which means a banished person. And the word, um, the I-L-E part of it, uh, come, means literally, uh, is the suffix meaning state or condition. Okay? Now, let's go to the Bible, book of Jeremiah, chapter 24, right? It says, after Nebuchadnezzar, king of, uh, king of Babylon, had carried away the captive Je uh, Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, with the craftsmen and the soldiers from Jerusalem, and had brought them to Babylon, the Lord showed me, and behold, two baskets of figs were set before the temple of the Lord. Now, Prophet Nobles Riley teaches us that we have to worship under our own vine and what? Fig tree, correct? Right. right now, also in this verse it says that when, the, you know, when these ones were exiled and taken away to this foreign land, they didn't just take just anybody, okay? It says they took the craftsmen and the soldiers. That's right. The book of Daniel, chapter 1, talks about it took the ones that were wisest in science, right. the mathematics and this, you know, the astrology and astronomy and so on and so forth, right? right? Example, when they say they, you know, went to West Africa and took these so-called slaves and brought them over here and whatever, and all of a sudden, when they brought them here, you know, they knew how to plant sugar cane. Right. They knew how to plant rice. They knew how to, the orange tree. They, right. all, you know, slaves don't have that kind of knowledge, mm -hmm. but masters do. That's right. All right? So what they did was they subjugated the best. You are the descendants of the best of the best, not the worst of the worst. That's right. All right? Verse 2. It said, one basket had very good figs, like the figs that are very ripe. And the other basket had very bad figs, so that they could not be eaten because they were so bad. Then the Lord said to me, what do you see, Jeremiah? And I said, figs, the good, the good figs, very good, and the bad figs, very bad, so that they cannot be eaten because they are so bad. Again, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Thus says the Lord, God of Israel, Like these good figs, so will I acknowledge the exiles of Judah. If you know anything about the twelve tribes, Judah was the one considered to be the beloved of the Most High. Okay? It says that, I will acknowledge this, uh, the exiles of Judah, whom I have sent out of this place to the land of the Chaldeans for their good. For their good. So there's something, see, in the more science temple of America, we're taught that on any form of adversity, you know, befalls you, you don't run from it, you embrace it because it's offering you a chance to challenge yourself. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Without an adversary, a soldier never knows the strength. That's so. It says, For I have set my eyes upon them for good and not evil, says the Lord, and I will bring them again to the land, and I will build them and not overthrow them, and I will plant them and not pluck them up. And I will give them a heart to know me that I am the Lord, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. And when, they re and when they shall return to me with their whole heart, and like the bad figs which cannot be eaten because they are so bad, thus says the Lord, so all I deliver Zedekiah, the king of Judah, and his princes, and the remnant of the people who are left in this city together with those who dwell in the land of Egypt. And I will make them a horror and an abomination and an evil thing. Now these are the bad figs, the allegory of the bad thing, right? This is the allegory of those who still choose to cling by Negro, Black, Colored, Ethiopian, right. African-American, etc. Yes, because you're clinging to principles that delude the slavery. You're clinging 
which means to hold on with your dead life, right? right. You cling to principles that you developed or you received during your exile, mm -hmm. right? And there's nothing empowering about holding on to something that you received while somebody had their foot on your neck. Right. Islam? Islam. Let me read that again. It says, I will make them a horror and an abomination, as the Sister Grand Governor demonstrated, abomination, right? Mm -hmm. And an evil thing and a reproach in all the kingdoms of the earth to be a, repro a reproach. A proverb, meaning that what's going on to us here is a lesson to the nations of the earth mm -hmm. to proclaim their nationality. Mm -hmm. Because nobody wants, wants to happen to them what that's happened to us. Right. So people are looking at the stuff that's going on to us right now. They look, every, the earth right now is looking at Puerto Rico. Wow! I don't want that to happen to me. We got to get it together. Right. right? They look at what happened to us in Texas and so on and so forth. Right? They look at what happens in Black Wall Street. Right. Yeah, we're going we gonna to build up an a economic district with no nationality but, and, and no citizenship. Right. right. Without citizenship, there's no rights of protection for you. So why would you build up an economic district if you're not vested and you're not a part of the government? So yeah, we did all that stuff in Black Wall Street, right? But we weren't in the city council. That's right. We weren't in the mayor. We yeah. weren't in the law enforcement. We, we, were, we weren't a part of that. We were disenfranchised, meaning not a part of the company. That's why we were Right? We weren't a part of it, but we're going to build something profound and wonder why the lawful citizens can not only destroy it, but get away with it. That's love. And it says, last verse, and I will send after them the sword, famine, and pestilence till I shall destroy them off the land which I gave to them and their fathers. Right? And that's for those who want to cling to that exile mentality. You see? Because the thing about it when you've been exiled, being exiled doesn't necessarily you know, have to mean that you got physically banished from your country. That's right. It doesn't mean we have to have, have get, gotten kicked out of America. Right, but we've forgotten that this land beneath our feet is our own. We've forgotten that this land beneath our feet was our forefathers' land. We've forgotten that before 1492, there were millions of us already here. We've forgotten that down in, in the jungles of Mexico, there are statues that look like my brother with the same hair, with the same natural. We've forgotten that, you know. And you know the archaeologists and so on and so forth—they bear witness to that. You see what I'm saying? But somehow we forgot. In the era of technology, we still choose to forget. Mm -hmm. You see? And as a result of that, right. the pestilence, the famine, every worst thing that can happen to a people on the planet Earth is happening to us right now. But yet we still choose to cling to the principles that delude us later. Yes, Lord. Right? Yeah. Now, the prophet Noble Drowley tells us about the end of time and the fulfilling of prophecies. Right. right? So, Moorish American Muslims, and let's make it clear, we are deep Muslims. Islam? Mm -hmm. The most American Muslims do indeed believe in prophecy. Meaning that the things that are happening now have been foretold right. by the oracles that were our forefathers and forefathers. None of this is new. Mm -hmm. If you know the ancient true and divine records, you know what's going to come to pass. That's right. right? Like right now, everybody's, um, you know, wow, man, what's Trump doing with North Korea and what's going to happen and North Korea has a nuclear bomb and, you know, these things must surely come to pass. That's right. You know, we're not going to get everybody. Some of us are going to be destroyed. Mm -hmm. Guarantee that, mm -hmm. right? And the ones that are going to be destroyed nine times out of ten are the ones that don't change, yeah, right? Exactly. How many yeah. times did you know somebody, and you know, it might have been somebody who was younger, your relative or somebody you were close to or whatever, and you saw them on a destructive path, mm -hmm. a destructive course, right? And out of the benefit of your own wisdom and experience, right? Not because you're being condescending, looking down your nose at them, right? But you know where that path is going to lead, right? right? So out of the goodness of your own heart, you decide to impart some wisdom to them to let them know, brother, man, sister, woman, if you decide to keep on that path right there, something will happen to you. Right. And I love you, and I don't want to see nothing happen to you. Mm -hmm. Islam? Well, that's what our forefathers were able to do beyond the age that they were in. See, a lot of times now we can do it, you know, they say 40 is the age of prophecy, right? So when you become 40 years old, Right? And something about that, you know, the biorhythms, you know, there's mm -hmm. every seven years, so on and so forth. By the time you get to 40, you're between a particular biorhythm where you're able to see certain things. Certain things, you know, before it even happens, you see it. And you find yourself giving more advice. Right? right? But you, we try to make our advice based in, you know, the laws, the divine laws of our forefathers and not our own general opinions. Yeah. All right? But our forefathers did the same thing. So these ones, known as Jesus. Right? So ones known as Prophet Muhammad, Buddha, Islam, Islam. Confucius, you know, yeah. Ruth, so on and so forth. These ones of our forefathers, right, cared so much about much about us, they went into the, the recesses of their, of their own being, you know, whether it was through a meditation, 
like Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, where in the, every ninth month of the Islamic calendar, he would go, which was the Arab calendar at that time, he was Arabian national. Um, he would go up on a mountain called Hira into a cave and meditate, right? It's a practice that he did because just to get him away, it's okay, you can let him cry, huh? right? He's family, let him cry. He's home, right? So he would go on that mountain just to get away from the, you know, the savage deeds of his of his kindred in Arabia, right? right? And one, you know, one year on his 40th, you know, 40th, uh, around the time he was 40, mm -hmm. he said an angel of light came to him, right? And he said that, you know, the light was so brilliant, you know, and the energy was so powerful, he almost couldn't breathe. He said the energy told him in the, in the Arabic language, Iqra, which means to read, right? right? And in his response, in Arabic he says, Yajib, because the angel's name is Gabriel, which is Jibrahil. He says, Yajib, Jibrahil, Ma'ana Bikari, which means, oh Gabriel, I'm not a reader. Meaning, I'm not a scholar. Mm -hmm. I'm not a poet like the men of his time. He was just a simple merchant. Right? And then three times, they went back and forth with this read. I'm not a reader, read, I'm not a reader. And it's, then he you know, wrote down the first four verses of what we now know as the, the Holy Quran of Mecca. You know, it says, read in the name of the sustainer who created you. Who taught man, taught man by way of the pen, that right. which he never would have known. Meaning that if you want to know what I'm, what I'm about to reveal to you, you got to do some study. You got to go back and see what that which was king before you. Mm. Islam? Yeah, we about to make you a prophet, right? But not in your own right. You got to study the prophets that came before you. Mm. And the prophets that came before you, it was a school of the wow. prophets. That's right. So y'all don't realize right now that you're sitting in the school of the prophets. You get the lessons that were taught in the ancient world. Right now, where you sit right now is known as the sacred grove. That's what That's we call it. Right? You know what that was in the ancient Canaanite language? Yeah, it's called Ashira. Yeah, if you look up Ashira, Ashira means sacred grove. Why? Oh. Because the, the people that were the disciples of Ashira used to be taught outside in these beautiful like gardens That's right. and so on and so forth. And the master would come out, the oracle would come out and demonstrate degrees and raise people up according to an ancient understanding. Mm -hmm. All right? Because every so often people find themselves falling away from the light of Allah. That's right. right? By virtue of the plane of existence that we've been incarnated in, we have a tendency of thinking of ourselves as individuals. Right. Forgetting that we are collective. Right. Forgetting that we're collective to all the forces in the universe. That's right. Forgetting that when you say Allah, right? Mm -hmm. You're talking about you too. Love. You know, we're not talking about, see, Catholicism, what it did was it created, it bound itself with a lot of pagan, Roman, and Greek ideals, mm -hmm. right? So what it did was they took God and put it up in the sky somewhere, mm -hmm. right? And that concept comes from the Greeks, right? Mm -hmm. And the Greeks dealt with what they call what? Mount Olympus, right? We had the pantheon of the Greek gods, right? And all the gods of, you know, the Greek gods lived on Mount Olympus, and the highest of them was Zeus, which was what the God of lightning, right? right? Even people right now, they say, if you say something blasphemy, I'm gonna get away from you, you might get struck by lightning. That's a Greek thought. Our people are still under that. Right. You got a, a, a contingency of people that pledge fraternities and sororities calling themselves Greeks, mm -hmm. right? Because they're so under that ideal, respect right. to that organized world. Mm -hmm. Islam, all right? But I'm saying all this is because be not dismayed at the things that you see and the thing, you ain't seen nothing yet. You know what I'm saying? Like, we in for some times. But if you're not rooted in the mind of your forefathers, this stuff will terrify you, right? right? But then, the ancient records of our forefathers, you know, pose a question that where did you get a spirit of fear? Mm -hmm. Because Allah did not create you with a spirit of fear. Uh -huh. You know, if you know where your forefathers were, they didn't know nothing about being afraid of nothing. Exactly. You know what I mean? You can't, you can't be no conqueror and afraid. Right. You know what I'm saying? Uh -huh. you can't be no punk talking about you're going to take over Spain and rule it for 800 years. That's like right now, you are... Um, we, you know, no radical agitating speech, hypothetics, right? I think my brother's working. No, let's talk. You know? That's right. Right now, for our hypothetics, we sitting there talking. You know what? We tired of the best everything being in Buckhead, right? Matter of fact, they're being kind of savage. Like, you know what? We gonna conquer Buckhead. We gonna run up in there. And we gonna we gonna put them under Islam. And we gonna civilize Buckhead, right? You can't take no punks with you on a. On a, on a, you know, something like that, because you're going to be met with a significant force, because people that have don't want to lose. Uh -huh. Right? So you know the contingent of Moors that went up in Spain in 711 AD, you know they were outnumbered when they got there. You know that. That's right. Right? They only took 7,000 men. Right? But General Tariq Ibn Zayed, right, he had a phenomenal strategy. Right? The strategy was they sailed over, right? They could have took small boats, but took bigger boats for them you know, to carry the amount of crew they had. 
But once they, you know, you know, they, you know, Doc hit shore, all the soldiers got off, right? You know, they were, you know, getting their battle arrays, you know, you know, you know, arrays and getting their swords and the bows together and all that. General Tardic, what he, what he, you know what I'm going, brother? General Tardic said, you know what? Burn the boats. Mm -hmm. Soldiers, right. no, no, excuse me, General Tardic. You know, if we burn the boats, we won't be able to get back. Exactly. <laughs> Failure is not an option. Well, we gotta make it work. You see, and that's the problem with a lot of us is that we haven't burned our boats yet. Mm -hmm. See what I'm saying? So we'll come into this morge, or we'll entertain the ideals of something higher and conscious, mm -hmm. you know, just as a conversation piece, so we won't look ignorant around people in conversation, right? Mm -hmm. But we still like the boat to be able to sail back to Negro land. Mm -hmm. <laughs> See, Negro land is safe. Let me take you to Negro land. Negro land is a place where you don't have to think. Imagine such a place. Why don't you have to think? Because everything is thought out for you. That's right. You don't have to choose a religion because there's already one for you, right? You don't have to choose an image because there's already one for you, mm. right? You don't have to build schools or curriculums because they're, they're already in place for you. That's Negro land. That's Negro land. That's, you know, that's slave, slave land. That's right. You see? This is the land of a people with no flag, right? Mm. So there's no protections there either, right? But our people don't mind an occasional, you know, this is on a subconscious level, they won't tell you this. We don't mind an occasional body count, right? As long as I can go to the ATM tomorrow and pull out some, right. some paper currency for some other people's forefathers on. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't mind an occasional body count as long as, you know, I can put my children on the school bus, not because I care about their education, because I need a break. Mm -hmm. You know, people send their kids to school because they're tired of dealing with them. They send them to school to get away from them mm -hmm. for eight hours a day. That's why Asiatic parents don't go to PTA meetings. Right. Anybody ever heard of a North Atlanta High School? No. Here in Atlanta. North Atlanta High School is the most expensively built high school in the state of Georgia. Now, Georgia's a big state. Mm -hmm. It's the most expensive. It costs about, when they first started building it, they, got, they had a budget for like 110 million. Mm -hmm. All right? Started building it, got it almost done, and they ran over. They said, ah, we need about 20 more million. No problem. Mm -hmm. Cut the check. Now, how does you know, how do they justify the budget for the, you know, for that particular school? It's based on the property value of the homes, the, the property taxes, mm -hmm. so on and so forth. So whereas the, you know, like the average home, you know, around that area is about 300,000, 250,000, 300,000. Mm -hmm. right, so their taxes are high, but they don't mind paying those high taxes because it's going to their children's education. Mm -hmm. Now they're hard, you know, we like to hustle the game of, you know, the districting thing. Let me use your address so I can my kids to go to school in your district. Mm -hmm. They don't play that way. You do that day, we went to jail. Mm -hmm. Right? Now, what do they have in North Atlanta High School? Right? We're talking about high school now. Right? Now think about where, if y'all from Atlanta, where you went to high school level, where your nieces, nephews, or children go to school. Mm -hmm. North Atlanta High School, they have a robotics lab. They have an international studies program. Right? Mm -hmm. They have a shooting range where you learn how to shoot rifles. Mm -hmm. In the high school. Mm -hmm. Right? They're preparing their children on a high school level to be world leaders, right? They're preparing their children on a high school level to go to Harvard and Cambridge, Oxford, so on and so forth, right? Meanwhile, our children are going to these Asiatic schools on Asiatic sides of town, and they're graduating them, and I've met children that can't tell time off a clock like that, mm. but he got a diploma in his hand, mm. you know? I've met children that graduated 12th grade and they can't do fractions, mm. you know, or placement value, right? And why is that? Because the parents don't demand better because the condition they're under doesn't allow them. That's thinking. That's outside of this condition. Mm. That's above that pay grade. Right. You see? Love. So the prophet Noble Drowley not dealing with victim mentality. He wouldn't let you be no victim. It's love. So every time you get to blaming somebody, you know, oh, that's your fault. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the, the European, your fault. The white man out of God, your fault. No such thing known as that. You know, we, the white man, we don't do that. It's love. White man, what's that's the boogeyman to us. Right. We don't do that. Right? We only do black men. We don't identify people by colors, you know, a crayon box. That's right. When people around the planet identify by their nationalities. Yeah. Islam. Islam? So you have to learn how to be yourself and no one else, right? Come out of that exiled mind state, right? Come back into your own land, right? Of when your forefathers ruled this land under that flag, this flag is flown on these shores for over 10,000 years. Islam. Prophet Noble Dryley went to go retrieve this flag. It was buried in a vault in Philadelphia. Uh. Why? Why was it buried in a vault in Philadelphia? Why would our flag be in Philadelphia? Anybody know? 
What was the first capital of the United States? Yep. Philadelphia. This was before DC. Mm -hmm. This is before that article, you know what I'm saying? In the first article, that's you know that subsection mm -hmm. where it said that Maryland and Virginia would cede. Mm -hmm. Which means to give or to allocate. Right? Portions of their particular colonies or states to create a federal government. Right? right. So in Article One of the US Constitution, you'll find that, you know, that you know uh, portion being mentioned. But before that constitution, there was one before that, known as the Article well, Actually Two, known as the Articles of Association yeah. and the Articles of Confederation. And under that, Philadelphia was the first uh, first government. Then they moved it to New York and called it the what? The Empire State. But they never told you what empire. Right? What? The British Empire? Because they were trying to get away from them. They were trying to secede or get away from the British Empire, right? And become Americans. But the term American existed before the Europeans became a government. Right? So when you give up, when you what they call expatriate, when you give up your nationality, you have to adopt or be adopted into another one. If not, you're in a, a limbo state called stateless. That's right. And a, as a stateless person, you can be abused. Example, you've seen this, and this ain't ancient history. Let me give you some recent. Y'all remember Hurricane Katrina? Mm -hmm. Remember that? Heinous was terrible about people, right? But what did they call our people on the news? Did they call them citizens? No. What did they call them? Refugees. Refugees. That's an exile state. That's right. right? That's why when they asked George Bush, you know, well, when you going down there? Mm, I'm gone. Mm -hmm. On my own time. You know, they ran up on Condoleezza Rice in D.C. at a shoe store, trying on shoes, pumps, stilettos, while people are drowning mm -hmm. in Louisiana, mm -hmm. right? Because she knowing law, like, well, you know, my people are, you know, they grow, they grow black and color, so according to law, we don't have to rush to get there because they're not real citizens, mm -hmm. right? And that sounds morally, right. morally, that sounds terrible, don't it? Mm -hmm. But law don't deal with morals. Yeah. Law don't deal with your feelings. No, I don't have nothing to do with your feelings, right? Like example, if you're a parent and you're raising children, mm -hmm. right? You have rules to your home, right? Now your children may feel as though the laws that you put down are unjust, right? right. Do your homework or you can't go out to the now. It's not outside now, it's PlayStation or Xbox now, right? Mm -hmm. But do your homework or you can't play Xbox. No, 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 you wanna play Xbox? No, no, no. They feel like you're being unjust, right? Mm -hmm. But you know that the law that you're putting down is for their betterment because they're, they're, they're minors, right? right? They don't have an adult view of the world, right? That's what a refugee is. That's what an exile is, right? This is a person that doesn't understand government. No. You've been taken out of a government understanding, and where are you going to learn the principles of government or governance mm -hmm. or how to govern yourself? If you knew how, if we, I'll put myself in that, if we knew how to govern ourselves, would our communities look the way that they do? Uh, you know? Sure. We can look and see trash all over the place. Right. When are they, when are they going to clean this up? Mm -hmm. Grass grown, all types of stuff. You know? <laughs> we see children during school hours, knowing they should be in school, but they're walking the streets. I've seen packs of children walking around smoking cigarettes at 12, 13. Just, you know, supposed to be in school, not in school. What are we doing about that? Should we have to depend on a truancy officer to deal with that? Or we, the parents in the community, should we come together and make sure, take your behind the school? As a matter of fact, I'm going to come up to the school and see why does this child want to avoid school? Islam, that's the concept, that's the mind state of a citizen. That's the mind state of one who's not exiled, right? Out of his own land, right? In his own land, the land starts here. Because you're tied to the soil, right? So when you're exiled out of your own land, you're out of your, literally out of your mind. You're out of your own being, and you're thinking someone else is inside. Mm -hmm. You know, that movie Get Out? Mm -hmm. You know, the sunken place, remember they talked about that? Mm -hmm. You know, where people, they look like us, right? But when you talk to our people, you know you're talking to Europeans, mm -hmm. right? Because it's that European psychology we talked about earlier. Islam? So that's what this Moorish is about, right? The people, Prophet Noble Drew Ali taught us, right? He said the Muslims are those that are in. All, you know, North, Central, South America, the adjoining islands, right? They'd be found in, it says the Arabians, you know? It talks about the Egyptians, called the Hamathites, the Mizraites, so on and so forth, right? Connects us all with the Moorish Empire. So all of this, right? He even mentions unto India and tells you that the people that are in India 
are descendants of the ancient Canaanites who are in this region right here, mm -hmm. right? So we set this stuff over here too, right? Okay. But if I went globally and I looked at, you know, an Asiatic as someone bearing melanin, right? The coloring thing, right? With wavy to woolly hair, right? That covers the whole spectrum, don't it? Right. You know, we come my sister's complexion right here, all the way down to darker than anybody in this room, mm -hmm. right? All of that is us, it's right? Us. Despite ethnicity, right? Despite really national origin, because as my brother Uncle Nancy put, you know, put on a Facebook post that I got from you that you quoted from Jose de Bente Bay, that we like to give honor for honors to do, um, that Moorish American is what is known as a supra, yeah. supra, not super. Supra nationality. Right? Meaning it's a it's a, a greater, like an umbrella that all the other sub nationalities form themselves under. Right? So if I say Moorish as a descent name, that could be Guatemala. Mm -hmm. That could be El Salvador. Mm -hmm. That could be Puerto Rico. Right. That can be Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi. You see what I'm saying? Right. That could be Arabian because the original Arabians look like us in this room. That's right. If any one of you right now went to Arabia, I've been, any one of us, you know, any one of you go there, right, and didn't say anything, mm -hmm. and just walked around, they'd right. swear you were from there. They wouldn't know. They wouldn't know. They come up to you having a full Arabic conversation, <laughs> like, man, I'm from Atlanta. Like, you know what I'm saying? You know, because they can't tell the difference. Exactly. See, those are the guilty truths. Most of us don't travel. And as a result of us not traveling, we think this is just some local thing. Right. right? But you travel, there's not a place on earth you can't go it and not right. find your own phenotypes. That's right. Right? And contrary to popular belief, all of us are not hermetic, meaning wide nose, thick lips, and woolly hair. We don't all come that way, even in your own family. That's right. Grandmama had about had thin lips, mm -hmm. you know, or sharp, what they call aquiline nose, or whatever, but might have been super dark. <laughs> You see what I'm saying? Because those features didn't originate with the European because he came out of you. Why the European invented two sciences, one known as archaeology, other one known as paleontology. Right? Because he's looking for his origins. Everywhere he digs, he finds you. Even Europe. The oldest bones in Europe are what's known as the Nubian Grimaldi. And it's always the sisters they find, older than us. And you know, the oldest one, one of the oldest ones in what Ethiopia they found was uh, Lucy. 4.3 or 4.5 million, right? Go up to Italy, it's another sister. You know what I'm saying? You know, and they know the sister, they, they know it's a sister by the bone structure, shape of cranium, so on and so forth. That's uh, right? So, point is, Moors, is that the Prophet Noble Drali coming down in a line, of, a long line of successions, succession of true and divine prophets, right? He had to deal with a particular set of circumstances that were different than the, the things of the past, as the brother demonstrated. Right? Meaning that all of our forefathers at least knew their nationalities. They just was worshiping foreign ideals. But they might have known they were Israelite. They might have known they were Moabite. They might have known they were Canaanite. None of them didn't know who they were. You see what I'm saying? First time in history was when that happened to us. See what I'm saying? I give an example. Like um, if I was to go to Mexico, right? So Mexico is a nation. Mexico has a flag, right. constitution, Islam, all right? They have a religion, we'll get into that later, right? But the point is, is they are a nation. When did Mexico really become a nation, right? Because if I go back, I have a book, I don't have it here, but you know, I have it in my collection. It's called The Conquest of Mexico, it's by John Prescott, right? It's actually called The Conquest of Mexico and The Conquest of Peru. But in there, they go to breaking down that before 1492, on these shores, in that land we call Mexico today, they had, a uh, legislative branch, yeah. an executive branch, mm -hmm. and a judicial branch. They had a Supreme Court mm -hmm. that was that had this had nothing to do with Europeans. That's right. This no. is what they had That's when right. the Europeans got here. That's right. Right? There was government already in place. Mm -hmm. Now did they have customs that might have seemed strange to outsiders? Yes, that's what customs are. Right? Even in international travel, there's things like, you know, you're coming through the border, it's not, you know, do you have anything you need to declare? Mm -hmm. You know, oh well, you know, I brought some spices back to us. We gotta see them because you know, in you know, let's, let's use Morocco, right? Well, in Morocco, those spices might be, you know, fine, but if inhaled by someone here whose natural, whose respiratory system ain't built for that, you could probably cause an inflammation, cause an outbreak, mm -hmm. right? So you know, you have to make sure that the customs are aligned when you when you interact. Islam. Islam. But the point is, is that 
these, you know, like, you know, the, the land of Mexico, like I said, they had their own, you know, organized government, but that land was not called Mexico. That's right. Right? And where Mexico comes from, that word mixed tequilas, which means to mix. Right? So when the Spaniards came over here, the conquistadors came over here and raped and molested and pillaged and did what they did wherever they went all over the earth. Right? They reformatted the government and so on and so forth. And then, you know, you have, of course, we have like people like Pancho Villa and some who were fighting them off and so on and so forth. Maximilian, all of them. They were fighting off so they could form their own ideal in the face of what they were under. Right? right? So they formed, they reformed the ancient government under a new ideal. That's what you call Mexico today. Right? Same thing. What you know as the United States of America is a reformed version of your ancient government that was already here. So the government that's here on these shores is operating is not a foreign government. It's yours being, you know, being demonstrated by someone while you're asleep. That's right. You understand what I'm saying? You know, and you have to do that until you wake up and they know the awakening is happening. Right? But you have to be taught properly because, you know, again, you know, prophet says I have to be careful how I wake you up because you might tear up something. Yeah. The first reaction when you find out you ain't no nigger and stuff like that, generally, is anger. Mm -hmm. Where's my land at? Why am I broke? Why don't I have this? Why don't I have that? You know, where's my birthright at? Right. Calm down, son. Yeah, All's well, we get you there. You know what I'm saying? You know, but the point is, is that, you know, you have to realize, after you come out of your amnesia and shake off the condition, you got to go back to being yourself and no one else. Right? And that super nationality that we all were was that which was considered Moorish. Okay? But we're on we're on the land of this flag, right? Which is not the European's flag either. Mm, that's right. I take this flag and I turn it this way. Take the blue, this is called a canton right here. This blue field is called a canton. That actually deals with masonry, right? And the stars right here and the Masonic Lodge, they have this on the ceiling. That's right. Right? And they call it the starry decked heaven. So they call it, right? So we put that there. When we took the Europeans and took the teachings of the higher self, the higher mind, we allowed them to demonstrate that on the, the flag of national origin, mm -hmm. all right? But if I took this flag and turned it this way, this was the flag of amity and commerce of the ancient Moors. And multiple, multiple people who were under us, we allowed to sail under this flag, okay? So both of these is ours. You just have to know what you're looking at, you know? And in a reverse form of worship, we end up giving the European too much credit. That's right. You can't go from thinking the earth was flat in the 1400s to knowing everything in 2017. It's not, it's not, it's that's not what it is, right? You have to know that all he did was take up where you left off, the things that he could understand, because he couldn't understand everything. That's right. You know, you talk about a man who didn't have a grammar system, ate meat raw, you know, wearing animal fur, they still do that now, I mean, they're fur coat, no. That was from the barbarian days, y'all still doing that. Right, right. They still eating raw meat, they call it rare. That's right. And try to make it elite. It's not everyone, everyone must say. <laughs> Hit it with the knife and blood shoots all out. Uh, <laughs> Does not? Uh, <laughs> Some of us, they ain't got no sense doing it, getting stomach, colon cancers, and all kinds of stuff, because you're not built like that. Uh, right? But the point is, is that both of these, right? More should make all of this is part of your birthright, your heritage. Uh, you're not no foreigner to this land. That's nowhere in America, right? And if your if your forefathers did come on some ships from another land to here, right? All it was was bring you from one of your one of your lands to another. That's, right. That's all it was. They didn't bring you to a foreign land, right? How do you think so-called slaves were able to escape and go among so-called Native Americans and hide and and they don't know who you are? Right. Like this brother right here escaped and, and went amongst the Blackfoot, right? Mm -hmm. And the European came looking for him. And they looked amongst the Blackfoot. He's standing right there, and they can't tell the difference between him and the Blackfoot. Right. That means they're the same people. That's, right. That's the same thing. Like they say, Jesus hid in Egypt, but the Egyptians were, were Europeans. Right? But if he's Asiatic, right. hiding, how's he going to hide in Egypt and so much? You see what I'm saying? Right. They told him lies in ancient times, they still tell them now. Right? But all pra praise be to Allah. Allah saw, you know, the fact that our karmic debt had been paid to the point where he saw fit to send us a prophet. Islam. Because before that point, we went through a lot before a prophet even came to us. There was a lot of prayers that went out. You know, a lot of weeping, we call weeping and gnashing the teeth. A lot of that was going on before we was even sent the prophet to remind us of our glory. Praise Allah. Praise Allah. But now we got to let people know that that prophet came because he came like a thief in the night. So if you weren't paying attention, he came and left. That's right. He did his work. You know what I mean? Because prophets ain't got no time to be sitting around kicking it. They busy all the time, you know, because they know their time. their time is numbered from the time that they come into this plane. Right? And they got work to do. You should, we should adopt that work ethic. Mm -hmm. Islam? 
One of my elders, uh, Minister James Muhammad from the Nation of Islam, peace and peace blessings be upon him, he said that work and work hard, right? So that your work will outlive you. That people will pick up your ideal and keep it pushing. Right? So that here we are, many, many, many years after Prophet Noble Jirali, but here we are still on a daily here status, right. demonstrating the ideal that he brought to our people that was the remedy to our, remedy to our people. Right? And put your fezzes on, put your turbans on, put your crescent pens on, put all that stuff on, so that way people force our people to ask the question. That's right. You know, change only comes when you're uncomfortable. It don't come when you're comfortable, right? Now, I'm gonna hit this and then I'm gonna lower the beat. According to the U.S. Constitution, how is a traitor defined? Anybody know? The word traitor, right? A traitor is defined as anyone who offers aid or comfort to the enemy, right? So in other words, you know how we all, um, and I'm doing this because historically this is the case, but Europeans are coming to Rome, right? And then a lot of our people would automatically start reworking our vibe to accommodate them. Mm. You know that? No. What, what do I mean by that? Like we, we having a good conversation, we vibe and we doing the, the melanin thing, right? If the European walks in, we might, you know, you know, put a little icing on it, smooth it off a little bit, so he don't feel out of place. No. Do they do that when we in the room? No. They care less. They gonna be them, regardless, no. right? Be yourself and nobody else, regardless. Islam wars. Yes, Until we get to that point. We still slaves. That's right. You know, and work on getting that mentality together actually before you put the fez. Right? Not saying that once you put it on, you gotta be perfect. Not saying that once you wrap your head, you gotta be perfect, right? But know that that's the mentality because once you put it on, right, people, you know, like your people will get a little, why do you have it on? Like, what's, what's that about? Like, you know, and the European make sure he puts all this anti Islamic stuff on the news to keep people away from Muslims. That, you ain't known a Muslim in this country to hurt you. How many Muslims in this country set German shepherds on women to bite their breasts off during protests? How many Muslims, you know, set water hoses on, on protests, just protesting for basic human rights? How many Muslims you know they do? Islam, you don't know any of that, but you know some Europeans have done it, don't you? No. I'm not trying to whip you up into some hate frenzy, right? But this is just reality. So we start dealing with the things that are real, we're deluding ourselves. As long as we delude ourselves, we're welcoming the things that happen to us. Right? So if we really want change and not just paying lip service to it, right, we'll put into place the program of Prophet Noble Jirali, which was the only solution to change the condition of any Asian accidents in America. And that sounds absolute, but it's an absolute truth. It's love. That's something you can bank on. It's love. Right? Um, real quick, in my process of lowering the meeting, um, when was it that the Hasidic Jews, right, got a state of their own and reparation. When was that? I mean, actually, I'll give you the answer. When did they get reparations? They didn't get reparations until they formed a state of their own. As long as they were living in other people's lands and pe taking other people's names and so on and so forth, they didn't get paid. Nobody paid them for their, you know, what they went through their suffering. None of that. But when they became a nation, organized body politics, when they became that, now they qualify for reparation. Why Japan? you know, gets checks to this day right. for what happened to them, right? Because Japan is a nation. That's right. You see what I'm saying? Oh. There's no reparations for descendants of slaves. That's right. Stop calling yourself that. You're not a descendant of a slave. Yes, no. Your forefathers and foremothers were not slaves. They were bondsmen and women. Mm -hmm. Okay? They weren't slaves. Slave is a whole other legal construct. So stop calling yourself slaves. Mm -hmm. Stop allowing people to call you slaves, right? I had a baby. Um, you know, this is a barbershop during the daytime period. And last Saturday, I had a uh, five-year-old, right? He was looking at the pictures around. You know, he's waiting for a second. He was looking around. He said, excuse me. I said, yeah, little man, what's up, man? He was like, were you ever a slave? I said, man, five? <laughs> he's able to articulate a thought mm. for someone being bound against their will at five? That's not even supposed to be on his mind. <laughs> He's supposed to be taught the glory yeah. of a people, not thinking on the base level of are you what have you ever been a slave? Yeah. Right? And if he has that thought now and that's not broken, what is he gonna grow up to be? Uh, you see, because you can only be what you can conceive of yourself being or what you've been. That's right. Islam? Uh, and with that I'll lower the minute. Islam Morris? Islam. Uh, Morris Science Simple of America, Noble Dry Lee, Home Office, Chicago, Illinois, March 11th, 1929, a warning. 
from the prophet to be read in every meeting. I hereby inform all members that they must put an end to all radical and agitating speech while on their jobs, homes, or on the public streets. We advocate peace and not destruction. Stop trying out your cause with the Europeans, for it causes confusion. There has been much confusion caused by members trying out their cards, the cards for your salvation. Failure of obeying my orders will be of severe consequence. We are for love, truth, peace, freedom, and when these principles are violated, justice must then take its course. Any member or group of members that seek to hold malicious feelings towards the temple or the prophet or to violate the divine covenant of the Moorish movement will receive their reward from Allah for their unjust deeds. All true Moors must obey the laws laid down to them by their prophet, and if they lose confidence in their prophet, give up your card and button, cease wearing your turban or fez, and return to the state where I, the prophet, found you. For this is a holy and divine movement founded by the prophet, noble Drew Ali. And if the prophet is not right, the temple is not right. The prophet is sending out a divine plea to all true Moorish Americans that they may do their part in protecting their prophet and the temple. This is an everlasting movement founded by the prophet through the will of Allah to redeem his people from their sinful ways. Peace. Noble Drew Ali Islam. 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 All oh, praise is due to Allah, the highest of honors, to his holy divine prophet. Noble Drew Ali Islam or us. Um, I'd like to leave you with this. Um, this past Wednesday, we had the honor of escorting uh, Brother Minister Stanley Muhammad of the Nation of Islam, Mosque 15B, uh, to court because he had to go to court because a European offended his daughter, called his daughter out of her name. His daughter's 15. Man is 62. Called his daughter a black bee. Okay? Now, if you know anything about the Muslims in any era, something we don't play is the offense of our women. Um, something I've been saying for years, you know, we've had that charter right there for this temple since 2006. And ever since we've had that charter, something I've always stated, because something I noticed here in Atlanta, is that the Islamic community here in Atlanta is very weak. I've traveled this country, and I've seen strong Muslim Philadelphia, Chicago, Detroit, Islam, various different strong Muslim areas. When I came to Atlanta, it's like what they call the Ummah, which means community, is very weak here. They don't work together. And by and large, that's because the brand of Islam that they're grabbing is devoid or lacking nationality or a national ideal, right? But I experienced something the other day when we went to escort the brother. We met at the mosque over there at 15B. And, you know, we went in. Uh, we were waiting for the minister to arrive with the FOI. And the MGT did a phenomenal job, you know, welcomed us in, we opened with prayer, got on one mind. It's okay, we just got the word, the minister's about to arrive. So we all got in our vehicles, you know, waiting. Brother Minister pulled up, you know, gave us honors, you know, one of the FOI took point, meaning he led. The minister followed him, we all caravan, bumper to bumper, right behind, going to the court. We got to the courthouse, we all got out, formation, two by two formation going back, walked to, you know, walked, you know, you know to the courthouse. And we had to go up to the second floor. When we got to the second floor. Um, the, the minister and his wife took seats, um, along with you know several elders, so on and so forth. But the, the vanguard of the more Science Temple of America and the, and the Fruit of Islam took post all around the lot, going around. And when I tell you the, how can I say, it? the response from those that were in the courtroom just walking around, just seeing disciplined men around, like, like you see right here, it threw them off. People weren't ready. They're not used to seeing us like that, uh. right? Um, one of the um, sheriff's deputies called the minister into the courtroom. I, excuse me, I need to uh, speak to you in here. So when he, you know, when he called him over, one of the fruit of, you know, fruit of Islam began to follow him. He said, well, well, why are you coming? He said, are you his backup? He said, yes, I'm his backup. So he said, hold on, let me get some backup. <laughs> so he called, he called some backup, whatever, but they went in. And, um, you know, the whole point is, it was a bunch of us, so they put us like in an overflow room. And we were in there, whatever, you know, just vibe, whatever. And every step of the way, you know, they came keeping, you know, keeping us posted as to what was going on, because they actually had to take the minister, uh, the minister, his wife, his daughter, and uh, a couple of the Fruit of Islam, and another courtroom to actually deal with the proceedings. Right? And, um, you know, they came back in. Well, actually, the, uh, 
the judge, because you know, some, you know, some preliminaries going on. So the actual judge came in and let us know, um, we're sorry for the inconvenience, sorry we couldn't accommodate you all, but we had other people on the docket, and we had to make sure that everybody had seen whatever, whatever. But we'll be sure, to, you know, facilitate everything, get you out of here nice. I mean, just royal treatment as though we were diplomats, as though we were dignitaries ahead of state, right? Why? Because they saw you orderly by way of the divine creed of Islam. See, Islam calls for order and discipline, right? And when you demonstrate that the nations of the earth know you're not playing, mm -hmm. right? When they see you opening what doors for your women, right? When they saw us coming in and the sisters were in the middle and flanked on the side by brothers, right? Protect the women and the children, protect. When they see that, mm -hmm. they know you're demonstrating principles of nationhood. Islam. And they know they have to fall in. Right? So what I'm telling you here is that you know, the will has been set in motion right, for a unity to be taking place amongst the Asiatic groups here in Atlanta. And the Muslims are leading the charge, as has always been the case. Okay? So I'm petitioning, I'm pleading, I even venture to say I'm begging my people to fall in accordingly. Because we're in the day and time where you cannot be you know, lukewarm. You have to be either hot or cold. Exactly. You're going to have to choose a side, right? And just like in the streets where, you know, you could be the snitch or the rat, but the person you snitch or rat to, once they finish using you, they're not going to have no use for you because they can't trust you, right? Exactly. Always stand with your people. Exactly. Always stand with your people. Say it again. Always stand with your people. That's a part of something to send the holy covenant of the Asiatic nations where states prefer not a stranger before their own blood. That's not a code that we live by, right? And Muslims are known historically for our brotherhood and our sisterhood. Islam. Anything happens to one of the sisters, the sisters are supposed to come together, I mean, just automatically and nurture and just be there, you know, to uplift and to support. If anything happens with the brothers, the brothers are automatically supposed to be there. And of course, the brothers are supposed to be there for the sisters, and the sisters are supposed to be there to back up the brothers. Islam. And when the nations of the earth see you working together like that, you know, they know we can't get between them and play sides, as has always been the case. You know, playing rival parties against one another, right? Because as far as we're concerned, if there's any rivalry that's going to go on, we're going to deal with that behind closed doors. <laughs> They'll never see it. Slime wars? Got to get back on that. That's historically what's been the greatest strides and advancements we made in this country for our people was came under those particular auspices, those particular set of circumstances, shake it off the Negro condition. Islam, so I pray Allah we did some good tonight. I pray Allah for our visitors. Welcome again. All right? Welcome, sister. You're welcome to come back at any time. All right? And this is the work that we do not only in here, but out in those streets and between groups. Right? And you're going to begin to see, you know, like I said, somewhat of our own United Nations for you. Mm -hmm. see? And then we can stop the wars and the religious controversy that's going on with our people. Right? Wow. And with that, our closes will begin. Everyone, please rise. They can. I see you got the baby. Please rise and face the east, which is right ahead of you. Hold your feet at a 45 degree angle, meaning standing on your square, meaning your heels will be touching like this. Raise five fingers on your left, two fingers on your right invoking the sacred presence of the seven Elohim that created everything that ever was, is, or evermore shall be. For our visitors, adopt a position of prayer that is comfortable for you and giving homage to our collective creator. Please repeat after me. Allah, the Father of the universe, the Father of love, truth, peace, freedom, and justice. Allah is my protector, my guide, and my salvation by night and by day. Through his holy prophet, Drew Ali. I mean, Islam, boys. Islam. Oh, man.